All right. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Becca Rabin and I work for the San Francisco Environment Department. Um, today, you'll get to hear from a number of great speakers. First, my colleague, Eden Bruckman, um, for a few minutes about the impact of fossil fuels and how going electric is part of San Francisco's climate action plan. Um, and then we'll get to hear um, from Jackie Randazzo about Clean Power SF's 100% renewable electricity. Um, and then we'll get to hear from Annika about um, electric vehicles, and then from Tony about home electrification. Um, so you're going to get a lot of great information today. Just some quick Zoom housekeeping. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A. We will get to them throughout the webinar and at the end as well. Um, and also, we'll mention a few programs and resources with links throughout, and we'll go ahead and email those links to everyone who's registered. Um, now I'll hand things over to Eden. Great, thank you, Becca. Um, so let's get started. Gasoline and natural gas are fossil fuels. And as you can see in this diagram, we tend to rely on fossil fuels in our day-to-day -day lives in a number of ways. Most cars are powered by gasoline and in our homes, appliances like our stove, water heater, clothes dryer and furnace typically use natural gas. Next. Fossil fuels impact our environment and our climate. For example, natural gas is mostly made up of methane. It's a super pollutant that will cause the planet to warm faster over a short, shorter period of time than carbon dioxide. According to the United Nations Environment Program, methane has accounted for about 30% of the global warming since pre-industrial times, and it's proliferating faster now than at any other time since record keeping began. The majority of San Francisco's emissions are from natural gas used in buildings and fuels used in cars and trucks. In 2019, 47% of San Francisco's greenhouse gas emissions were from transportation and 41% were from buildings. We must commit to switching to clean renewable energy sources to achieve the deep emission reductions that will avoid the worst impacts of a changing climate. Next. Fortunately, San Francisco has set a citywide goal to become a net zero emission city by 2040. To help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector, we're actively working on expanding electric car charging to help spur electric car adoption. The city has an ordinance requiring large commercial garages to expand charging to 10% of their spaces, and we're following suit by doing the same in city-owned parking lots. We're also conducting research to evaluate the cost benefit of curbside charging, and we have secured over $2 million in grant funding to install new fast changing hubs in three new locations across the city. In the building sector, we passed policy eliminating natural gas from new construction over the last couple years. Next, it will be important to develop policy for the electrification of our existing buildings, such as requiring electrification of appliances when they are due for replacement. The building operations section of San Francisco's 2021 Climate Action Plan outlines our approach to eliminate natural gas from buildings and transition entirely to clean, renewable energy sources. What's our next major milestone for transportation? 100% of car sales by 2030 are electric cars without increasing the number of vehicles in San Francisco. To learn more about these commitments, I encourage you to visit sfclimateaction.org. Next. So what is electrification? Electrification means switching from gas to electricity powered appliances and equipment. Next. Why electrify? Electricity in San Francisco is set to be 100% greenhouse gas free by 2025. Powering with electricity is a way to power with 100% greenhouse gas free energy in the very near future. And it avoids the health and safety risks of natural gas. Next. So here's what a home that relies on clean energy looks like. Our stove, water heater, space conditioning system, and clothes dryer can all be super efficient and powered by electricity, just like there are options available for electric cars. Plus, installing solar photovoltaic allows you to source some of that energy right on site. 
And now I'll hand things over to Jackie Randazzo from SFPUC to talk to you about how you can sign up for 100% renewable electricity from the city. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Hi everyone. My name is Jackie Randazzo. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a senior communication specialist here with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about how we as an agency are supporting San Francisco going all electric. Next slide, please. The San Francisco Public Utilities Commission is the city's clean energy utility. We deliver clean, affordable, and reliable electricity through our Hetch Hetchy Power and Clean Power SF programs, which together serve over 70% of the electricity used in the city. Together, our programs work to reduce the city's carbon footprint and combat climate change. Next slide, please. So for today's webinar, I will focus specifically on how our Clean Power SF program is supporting our customers going all electric. Clean Power SF provides clean electricity to more than 385,000 customers in San Francisco. If you live in San Francisco and pay a PG&E bill, you're most likely our customer. We're proud to share that Clean Power SF has a goal of providing all of our customers with 100% renewable electricity by 2025. We also have several other initiatives to support San Francisco and our customers going all electric, which I will get into um, over the next couple slides. My colleague from Bay Run will also talk more about our heat pump water heater rebate later in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So as has been previously mentioned, um, one of the easiest ways you can go all electric, um, even as a renter in San Francisco, is to upgrade to our 100% renewable electricity service called Super Green. For less than $3 per month or more per month, you can help power your home or apartment with only solar, wind, or geothermal sources. As a super green customer, you're also helping to support new renewable energy projects being built right here in the Bay Area in California. So the picture on the right is actually of a new solar development in Blythe, California, which is in Riverside County in Southern California that was built a few years ago and began uh, serving our customers in 2021. We also want to make sure we provide access to clean energy for all San Franciscans. So we also recently launched a program called Super Green Saver, and it's a program that provides 100% renewable electricity at a 20% discount for qualifying customers. Next slide, please. So in addition to our super green service, we also offer special electric rates for customers who have rooftop solar systems or own electric vehicles. For our rooftop solar customers, we pay more for your extra energy than other utilities like PG&E. If you own an electric vehicle, you can maximize your savings on our special EV rate by charging your car between 12 a.m. and 3 p.m. And finally, in our commitment to equity, Clean Power SF also launched a new program that supports customers with low incomes by helping them to repair a key component of their solar system to ensure it continues uh, functioning properly. And you can get more information, um, as you can see there on your screen, at cleanpowersf.org slash solar inverter. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to, I believe, Annika, who's going to talk about EV incentives. Thank you so much, everyone. Great, thank you so much. My name is Annika Osborne and I'm with Cool the Earth, an environmental nonprofit with a mission to reduce carbon emissions and air pollution. While we are big fans of walking, biking, public transportation and carpooling, uh, preferably in an electric car, with our Ride and Drive Clean collaboration, we focus on educating and engaging Bay Area residents around zero emission vehicles like electric cars and e-bikes. I wanna thank uh, Becca Rabin and the San Francisco Department of Environment for sponsoring today's webinar and inviting me to talk about switching to driving electric. Next. 
Uh, so here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna talk about the benefits of driving electric, EV incentives. We'll touch briefly on uh, some of the current and coming EVs. They will be included in, you'll see a whole showcase of current and coming EVs in uh, the PDF that will come in a follow-up email. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about charging EVs and then at the end, we'll have some time for, for questions. Thank you. So there are many benefits to driving electric. In California, our passenger vehicles are the single largest source of GHG emissions, representing up to 50% of our individual carbon footprint. So when you switch from a gas car to an electric car um, and plug into clean energy, like we can here in San Francisco, uh, you are taking impactful climate action by reducing both carbon emissions and air pollution, both which disproportionately impact equity priority communities. Uh, and in addition but to reducing your impact on the planet, it's a, a little more fun to drive electric. You can save time, money, and actually improve your driving experience with an electric car. Next. So although uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more, a little bit about how to save money with an EV now. So although early EV drivers paid a high premium for electric cars, today's EV drivers often save money. And here are some reasons why. It costs much less to fuel an electric car. Fueling a gas car can be two to five times more expensive than fueling an EV, depending on where and when you charge it. And electricity prices tend to be more stable than gas prices, as we saw uh, definitely last year. In addition, maintenance costs are 40% lower for EVs. It's basically adding windshield wiper fluid and rotating your tires. And then there are the standard incentives available for up to $9,500, which can bring down the cost of purchasing or leasing an EV. So we'll get into those now. Next. Great. So um, there are currently four types of incentives that can save you $9,500 or even more for a fully electric new or used EV and a little less for plug-in hybrids. Additional grants and rebates are available for both new and used cars for residents who qualify. And I'll mention just right now, we're not gonna talk so much about that, but um, if your income level is um, four times the federal poverty level or below, there are many, many more incentives that are available. Um, I can, uh, I can, uh, I guess I can invite you to some other webinars that go a little bit more and focus more deeply on those. Um, those income qualifying, you know, rebates. So the California state rebate is available for many EV buyers, and it has some income qualifications and vehicle price limits. You do have to claim this rebate within three months of taking delivery of your EV. The federal tax credit was revamped last year, and now it's called the clean vehicle credit. There are new qualifications for this tax credit, and we will review them on the next slide. Um, and new this year, there's a credit for used EVs, which is exciting. Uh, and the good news is there's no longer a vehicle cap per manufacturer. So the EVs that had met their limit, like Chevy Bolt and Tesla, are eligible again. Um, depending upon where you live, there may be additional utility and CCA incentives, um, like we just heard with the um, charging, you know, special charging rates between midnight and 3 p.m., uh, in San Francisco. And if you'd like to install a charger at home, there's also a home charging tax credit up to 30% of the cost um, or 30% of the cost up to $1,000 of the install and hardware. And you can also get paid for retiring your older gas car. Um, these savings calculators listed will help you find out exactly which incentives you qualify for. So I am not a tax expert, so you may want to verify that you qualify for these tax credits with a tax professional. Next. All right, so the details of the clean vehicle credit are being released in phases, and there is great opportunity to qualify for the credit now until sometime in March, when the next phase of the credit concerning batteries will likely become, uh, will likely reduce some of the incentives. So now is the time to get an EV if you can. But in order to do so, um, let's review some of the new requirements. So the EV must be purchased or financed to receive the credit, and it goes against your tax liability. So if you want to get the $7,500 uh, tax credit, you have to owe $7,500. 
good to note we're in the beginning of the year, so we might be able to adjust how much we pay in taxes at this uh, point. Um, so some of the requirements, um, these uh, the EVs must have final assembly in North America. There is a VIN decoder to help determine where your vehicle is assembled. Like for example, the Volkswagen ID4 may be assembled. Some, some of them might be assembled in North America and others in Germany. So you wanna make sure the one that you get, the VIN number on that one, that it, you, know, you can check with your VIN number is made in North America. Uh, there are also vehicle price limits and income limits now. Um, and then likely in March, according to the IRS, uh, they will be adding a critical mineral and battery component requirement, which may make many of the EVs that are listed on the next slide ineligible for the tax credit. We don't know, we won't know until each manufacturer releases this information and the IRS updates their website. Um, so there is there may be a little bit of a workaround for all of these uh, requirements. You may be able to lease a new EV and the dealer might pass on the credit to you. So this is through a commercial tax credit. So if the dealer purchases the car and then um, pass, decides to, you know, to claim that tax credit, they, they may be able to pass on the 7,500 to you in the, and they would, they would pass it on, you know, they'll take the final amount of the car and subtract $7,500 before they calculate your lease payments. So the interesting thing about this is that now there are no vehicle price limits, there are no income limits, and these cars don't have to have final assembly in North America. So if you're looking to get that Kia EV6 or the Hyundai Ioniq 5, if the dealer is willing to pass on the credit to you, that still might be possible. But definitely check in with the dealer to see if they are willing to do that. Um, yeah, so new this year, um, if you purchase a used EV, you may be able to get 30% up to $4,000. Um, there are more stringent income qualifications for this, and the price of the car has to be less than $25,000. Um, and some really good news is that in 2024, uh, these the federal tax credit will be available as an upfront rebate, so it will not go against tax liability anymore. And if you can get that $7,500 upfront, it'll really help with the down payment. So in general, we're very pleased with these new um, changes that you know the state and the federal government are doing because we think that uh, they're going to be providing funding for people who really need it, uh, developing new green jobs. And uh, with this new critical mineral and battery component, we're gonna be sure that we're sourcing uh, the battery components from, from more ethical, you know, more ethically. Okay, next. So as I mentioned, between now and sometime in March, according to the IRS, qualifying consumers who purchase the vehicles on this slide should qualify for the clean vehicle credit. Because there is a new price cap on EVs, not all trim packages of these cars may qualify. So just because the car is listed on the slide, it's not guaranteed that it qualifies. Um, I will actually send uh, Becca the link uh, where, where I got this information and they're gonna be updating that inf this information you know, in, you know, as they get more information. So that will be handy. Okay, next. So some people are worried about buying EVs because they won't be able to power them during a power outage, but EVs can actually help during a power shutdown. You can plug in an inexpensive 300 watt inverter, the red box, uh, to the accessory port and power up small appliances like cell phones, laptops, and LED lights. While this low wattage inverter cannot power up your refrigerator, some of the new EVs out that, that came out last year, like the Kia EV6, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, and the Ford F-150, can because they have higher wattage bi-directional batteries. The F-150 Lightning can even be integrated into your home's electrical system to provide backup energy to your home. It acts like a generator at home and it's a battery on wheels when you need electricity away from home. Um, okay, next. So 2023 is super exciting because there are so many new and different, different models out there. With so many new models and incentives, there is an EV or e-bike 
for every lifestyle and budget. So most fully electric cars offer 200 to 300 miles of range, and some will go even farther on one charge. This means that you can go from San Francisco to Tahoe with just a 15 minute charging break. And with some of the EVs, you don't even have to stop to charge. On the way back home from Tahoe, you won't have to stop to charge with the majority of these cars because there's something called regenerative braking in EVs. So when you are um, going downhill, you're actually charging your battery. So that's pretty cool. You can also go with most of these cars. You can go from San Francisco to Sacramento and back without having to stop to charge. This was not the case five years ago, except for some very expensive EVs. So this is really, really great news. Uh, next, so just real briefly, there are over 30 battery electric cars that run only on electricity on the market today, including trucks. All electric EVs range from $26,500 to over $100,000, but there are many, many models available under $40,000, and that's before incentives. Next. So EVs have been around for just 10, 12 years or so. And because this EV technology is so new, many people have leased their EVs. So there are, uh, there have been, and there continue to be many used EVs available on the market. So since a lot of people are leasing, those cars are coming off their leases all the time. Um, okay, next. So people get worried about charging, but for many people, 80 to 90% of charging is done at home or at work. And charging at home is easy. There are two options for charging at home. Um, if you have an outlet, the first is an easy, no cost solution. It's, and it's ample for most people. Just plug in the charger that comes with your vehicle into a standard 120 volt outlet. It gives you 25 to 40 miles of charge in eight hours, which is usually overnight when you have those good EV uh, rates. Uh, just enough to replenish your battery. People in the Bay Area drive an average of 23 miles a day. So this easy solution works out great for a lot of people. But if you do drive more than 50 miles a day, you may want to purchase a home charging station for level two charging. You'll get about 25 miles an hour. So you can easily get a full charge overnight if you need that. Um, and then when you're charging away from home, there are many level two public chargers available. So you can charge when you're at work, around town, in parking garages, when you're hiking out at Chrissy Field. Uh, but when you're on a road trip, you will want to fast charge with a level three charger, which is the fastest charging available. Different EVs charge at different speeds. So there's, that's something to be aware of when you're planning, you know, if you're planning to do a lot of public charging. Next. So there are several EV charging solutions for people who live in apartments and condos and more solutions on the way. Uh, so if a charging station is not available, uh, people charge at home by plugging into a standard 120 volt outlet if that's available. There are new smart outlets, which are an inexpensive charging solution that also handles billing. And people charge at work when the sun is shining and we have plen plenty of uh, solar energy available and other people use public chargers close to work, if that's convenient. Uh, again, as I said, charging at a pub public charging stations is very common. Um, and with fast charging, we'll give you about 70% of your battery charge in about 30 minutes. You can lobby your property owners to install standard 120 volt outlets or a bank of level two chargers as well. Next. So once you start driving electric, it's ideal to charge your EV from rooftop solar. There's a federal tax credit available for the next 10 years for 30% of the install cost. It's a great feeling when you to charge your car from the electricity that you generate from your own roof. There's also something a bit time sensitive here. I believe that if you get solar before the middle of April, um, you can, or if you actually sign up and sign a contract to get solar, you will be locked into a uh, better um, electricity rate. Uh, when you go, um, so when you go electric, you can also choose the clean energy plan from, you know, like Clean Power SF, super green, um, so that you're charging your EV with clean energy coming from the sun and the wind. And uh, as Jackie mentioned, uh, your utility offers a special reduced EV or time of use rate. 
so that when you're charging between midnight and 3 p.m., it's a really, really affordable electricity. Next. So taking a road trip is getting simpler all the time. There are thousands of public charging sites that provide fast charging using apps like PlugShare or a better route planner. It's easy to plan a trip and find chargers along the way. You can map out your trip on your computer the night before and then use your app when you're on the road. Electrify America, EVgo, and ChargePoint all offer app or card-based uh, stations. So you can just tap, charge, and go. Next, this is like my last slide here. Uh, so Ride and Drive Clean is ready to help you go electric. We offer weekly Zoom webinars, EV101 for basics and EV102 to help new EV drivers. We have a bunch of uh, events or webinars coming up in the next month or so. Uh, we have a robust website highlighting available and coming EVs, e-bikes, how to EV section, including steps to driving electric so that you can uh, you know, easily find, you know, figure out, you know, get some good resources. Uh, we also offer um, EV car shows so consumers can check out a bunch of cars all in one place uh, with EV owners, not car dealerships. Um, and twice a year, we, well, we often partner with uh, different organizations like Cartelligent for EV and e-bike discount campaigns. Also the new wheel for an e-bike discount campaign. We'll be doing more of these this year. So my, uh, we really, so we really need to get off fossil fuels as soon as possible. I hope you'll pledge to make your next car electric and sign up with Ride and Drive Clean so we can help you go electric. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat so you'll have the opportunity to pledge to make your next car electric and sign up for updates about all things EV. Uh, thanks again to Becca and the SF Department of Environment team for your partnership. Um, and next slide. <laughs> Okay, thank you for your patience. I know that's a lot of information. I invite you to come to one of our EV 101 webinars or any of our webinars for a little bit of a slower paced um, presentation where you can ask questions. Thank you, Annika. And we'll do a Q&A at the end, um, but uh, I think there may be some questions in chat that you can answer um, before that. Um, but now, now we'll go over um, to Tony to hear a bit about home electrification. Hi, my name is Tony Jung. I'm with the Bay Ren Home Plus program. I'm a senior energy advisor. Uh, we're a single family program for homes with one to four units. Uh, next slide. I'll talk a little bit about who, who we are, who is Bay Ren, and then we'll talk about going electric and getting started down that path. Next slide. Uh, Bay Rand is the Bay Area Regional Energy Network. It's a collaboration of the nine county governments of the Bay Area, including San Francisco. And uh, we essentially manage the uh, utility rebate programs for PG&E customers in the entire Bay Area. So if you have a PG&E bill uh, and single family home, one to four units, you can qualify for rebates. We've been doing this since 2013. All right, next slide. So why go electric? What are some of the reasons you want to consider going this direction? Uh, one of the most recent things, next slide, uh, that uh, is becoming more important to know is indoor air quality. Uh, the EPA did a study where they found that about uh, the air quality of our homes is two to five times worse than the typical out there air, outside air quality. Uh, and we spend 90% of our time in buildings. You know, we're either at home, work, or school. And where do we spend most of that time? At our home, in the evenings at, and at night. And since the air quality from the study shows that the air quality is worse because we're enclosing the building, things get trapped in there. And who is susceptible? If you have an underlying um, uh, lung condition like asthma, uh, children, because they're younger and have less developed lungs, they're all susceptible to some of these irritants that are in the air that affect our indoor air quality. One of these is actually, um, if you have a gas stove or gas oven, uh, because those generate and combust directly in the air in the kitchen, uh, some of the byproducts of combustion gas burning is carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrous oxides. And the nitrous oxides are actually the ones that cause a lot of lung irritation. And they found through meta studies that there's a strong correlation with homes that have gas ovens and gas cooktops and the children that have uh, underlying 
lung conditions that have asthma from these homes. So it's something to consider about um, what do we use in our homes and what do we produce in our homes? In this case, cooking with gas in the home. If you have a gas stovetop, always turn on the fan. That's one thing you should always consider doing. Or we'll talk about changing those out. The other gas appliances in, in most homes, natural draft water heaters. They always spill a little bit of, of exhaust when they first start up in your home. And then lastly, furnaces. If you have an old style gas furnace, that's another source of pollutants in our home. So indoor air quality, the gas of gas appliances that you may have in your home today can have an impact on the air quality inside your home. Uh, next slide. Okay. Another one, Bay Area. We live in earthquake country. So having a gas appliance, uh, we're always at risk if the earthquake happens to go and you have a traditional gas tank water heater. We have a gas line an 800 pound tank and an open flame. That's what happened in uh, the Marina District. So, you know, side note, be prepared for earthquakes. There is a 60% greater, ch greater chance we'll have an earthquake in the next 30 years. So if you have a mortgage, chances are there's an earthquake before your mortgage is paid off. So gas appliances is a potential risk since we live in earthquake country. Uh, next slide. And as mentioned earlier, uh, that if you go electric, adding photovoltaics is a, something that you have actually even more control because we have true local sustainable energy, really on your rooftop. Uh, the potential for storage using batteries is now becoming available. And with solar, you have more control over your electricity costs down the road. So that's a great investment to consider when you go all electric. This is something that's a great addition. Uh, next slide. So what can you do to start this path or journey toward electrification? Let's go to the next slide. There are incentives available to you and tax credits. Uh, I'm with the Bay Ran Home Plus program, and we have participating contractors that can help do improvements and qualify you for rebates toward electrification. Uh, and there's actually a second program that's partnered with Clean Power SF. It's a contractor rebate program. Uh, this helps contractors that are joining that program install heat pump water heaters and get a discount toward this project. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these. Uh, next slide. One of the biggest things you can change is your water heater. Water heaters have a typical 10 to 15 year lifespan, uh, usually correlates with the warranty. But with heat pump water heaters, they can be three to four times more efficient. Uh, typically for a gas water heater, it can be about two times more efficient. So that not only do you save energy, but you're going a more carbon free neutral route by going with electricity. And the way the heat pump water heater works, it's like your refrigerator. It takes the heat from the surrounding air and puts it into the water. And it's just moving heat into the water. It's not combusting something, burning something to generate the heat. It's actually utilizing the air around the space of the water heater to extract the heat. And there's a side benefit. It actually dehumidifies too. For those of you who live parts in San Francisco, like the sunset where it's kind of dampish, the heat pump water actually helps dry out the room that it's located in, like in a garage. Uh, next slide. To help you go that path, the Bay Ren Home Plus program, if you have a gas water heater, can, you can qualify for $1,000 toward uh, the installation of a heat pump water heater in your home. And then Clean Power SF, uh, they've partnered with uh, the Bayron Regional Heat Pump Water Heater Program. Uh, you have to be a Clean Power SF uh, customer. And that those contractors that have joined that program, the regional program, uh, can qualify for a $1,000 incentive for installing heat pump water heater. And that's a benefit to you. So let's take a look at a project. Next page. So today, uh, it, you can install a heat pump water heater. You can get $1,000 from the Home Plus program with one of our participating contractors. And if you also pick a contractor, and many of them are also part of the, uh, the contractor incentive program, there is up to $2,000 available for this project. Uh, the $1,000 is going to come from the Home Plus to the homeowner. The 1000 is to the contractors who install heat pump water heaters. So they've been trained. They have additional knowledge of heat pump water heaters. So they can offer a better discount by this additional incentive that they get for installing heat pump water heaters. 
So key is find a participating contractor in both programs. And you can find it on our webpage. I'll paste the link to the, uh, uh, the Bayren webpage, Bayren uh, Home Plus uh, program uh, after this section in the chat. And that's available, $2,000. But in addition to that, starting in 2023, there are now federal tax credits that can actually help you switch from gas to electricity. So let's take a look at what the federal tax credit is uh, for 2023. Next slide. So for 2023, the tax credits has now become an annual tax credit of $3,200 every year. So that's the maximum rebate from the federal tax credit. And that's good from now to December 31st, 2032. So 10 years for heat pump appliances. So this is a heat pump for space conditioning or heat pump water heater. There's an annual limit of $2,000 for essentially that category, anything with a heat pump. So heat pump for space conditioning, heat pump for water heaters. There's a $2,000 credit available of that 3,200 available to you. Uh, the second category, home envelope improvements. And that's also another important area to consider. There's a $1,200 annual limit. Uh, these all relate to about 30% of the cost of the project. So insulation, windows, doors, electrical panel upgrades when linked with a heat pump project and a home energy audit can all count toward this $1,200 annual limit. So in all for federal tax credit, every year you have up to $3,200 federal tax credit available to you. Um, I like going to this Energy Star website. That's the link on the bottom of the page. It's because it has to be an Energy Star appliance to qualify for these uh, federal tax credits. So I like their webpage because it gives a nice overview of the federal tax credit that's available to you, whether it's heat pump, high efficiency equipment, uh, insulations, and all that. So check out that webpage, but please talk to your tax preparer because there are some more additional nuances with federal tax credits that you should look at first before you go down that path. So Definitely up to 3,200 available every year for the next 10 years. Uh, talk to your tax preparer about how to help prepare yourself to take advantage of these with, with this electrification pathway. Uh, next slide. Other things available from Bayrent. If you have a gas cooktop, we have a $750 rebate available for you to change from gas cooking to an induction. Lots of benefits from that. Uh, they're more efficient for heating, then they don't produce any byproducts from the combustion process. So none of that nitrous oxide or carbon monoxide from using an induction cooktop. And many professionals are finding that it's much better for cooking because you actually have more control than gas and it's safely done. So because it heats the pot directly, they have the ability to just lift the pot up just an inch or two and it stops, stops heating the pan automatically. So there's different ways of using cooking that uh, is much more beneficial using induction. And also, if you notice from that picture, this, the cooktop surface doesn't get very hot at all uh, when using a pot, you know, compared to an open flame. And just a quick way to check, does my pot, existing pots or pan work with induction? Uh, many uh, pots and pans now have a label or a stamp on the bottom of the pan that would indicate if it's induction compatible, it looks like a series of coils, or if you have a good magnet. If it sticks to the bottom of the pan, it works for induction. If it doesn't stick, so if it's all aluminum or copper, all copper, they it's not compatible with induction. But if so long as it has an iron core and a magnet will stick to it, it will work with induction cooktops. And there's $750 available for switching your cooktop out to an induction cooktop. Uh, next slide. If you have a gas dryer, uh, you have an opportunity for $300 to switch from gas drying to a heat pump clothes dryer. The benefit of a heat pump clothes dryer, no venting. So literally you don't have to bother renting that long tube that goes outside that can be a fire hazard in itself. So a heat pump, they're new to the new to North American market, but we have a $300 rebate if you're uh, to get rid of those gas clothes dryers and switch to a heat pump clothes dryer. Okay, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other technologies that are coming up and have some can qualify for rebates. Heat pumps for space conditioning. Uh, heat pumps can both heat and cool your home and it offers true zoning controls. So the picture you see here, uh, there's two parts to it. There is an outside unit uh, that then extracts heat from the outside. And then there's an indoor unit that would output heat when it's in heating mode and does the reverse when it's in cooling mode for that. 
Uh, next slide. So for space conditioning, it's more efficient to heat a home than gas uh, because it's moving heat into home. It's not actually combusting and generating heat uh, from that. It's a more gradual heating of the home. So it's using more efficiency because this does a gradual heating and maintains the temperature. Uh, with the traditional gas furnace appliance, you notice how it frequently goes on and off is because it has to, it generates so much heat. It has to push all that heat into the home very quickly. So often when you feel uncomfortable with the furnace is that it's overheating the home and then it turns off to cool down that turns on again. So you get this sort of up and down cycle that's a lot of people don't like. And so it's an uncomfortable feeling. Uh, this is the benefit of a heat pump is that it's a more constant gradual heating. It's not overheating your home. It's sort of heating to the target temperature and maintains that. So it's more comfortable, typically quieter than a gas furnace. Another benefit as mentioned is that it can cool uh, in parts of San Francisco where it's a little damper like sunset or other areas. It actually has a dehumidification mode, so it can help dry out and make the home feel more comfortable and deal with you know those uh, you know damp colder spots in the home by drying out or just warming it up a little more gently. And so you have the advantage of using this to uh, get rid of gas in your home. Uh, now it's an important part of that. If you can use less energy, whether it's gas or electricity, that helps lower your bills and just helps all around. So as part of what you need to consider is look at air sealing and insulation in your home. Because if you can use less energy, create a smaller footprint, whether it's gas, electricity, that's gonna help us all in the long run. More energy to share for your electric vehicle, less pollutants if you still have a gas appliance. So consider also improving your home envelope as part of this whole project. Next slide. So with the heat pump incentives, we're just getting started with relation to gas heating appliances. Since we are a utility efficiency rebate program where we have to work with the rules to switch over, but we do have some cases right now where if you have these conditions, you can switch from a gas appliance to a heat pump. So in your home, if you have a centrally ducted furnace with an air conditioner, you can switch to a heat pump and get $1,000 more program. Uh, if you happen to have a wall or floor furnace, which happens to be in a lot of San Francisco homes out there, you can actually install a ductless uh, mini split heat pump and qualify for $1,000 from the Home Plus program. Uh, down the road, we're going to actually be expanding it, but we are limited by some of the rules. But as I said, this is the beginning of a, of a race, and we just got started. And these are the first uh, cases that we can do direct fuel switching from gas to electricity. So if you have any questions, we have an advisor team that can help talk more about this. And let's see, next slide. The Home Energy Advisors, it's a free service to you. Uh, we offer technical advice. Uh, we understand the programs, the ins and outs of the program. Uh, we can help you find our participating contractors so that you can find a contractor that is knowledgeable in home improvements or switching from gas to electricity and any other related complementary programs related to efficiencies. You can call us at the 800 number listed, 866-878-6008, or, and I just realized that's the old web link. <laughs> we have a newer one, I'll post that up there on the webpage, but that's an old one, it still points to it, but that's the old link uh, for that. And I think that completes my section and it's gonna open up for Q and A's next. All right, thank you, Tony. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, um, all the links that you've heard mentioned today, um, I'm gonna go ahead and send a follow-up email in the next couple of days with all of those links. So don't worry if you didn't write them down um, or anything. And um, I'll send out a link to the recording um, of this webinar as well. Um, and we can share slides also. Um, so you'll be getting more information than you ever wanted um, from me. Um, so I'll go ahead and look at what questions we still have remaining um, in Q&A. Um, okay, it looks like we have a question um, for Annika. Um, what happens if you don't have a garage to charge your EV? Does SF have plans to add charging stations around the city neighborhood? I don't really know what okay. the SF plans are, but um, we do know that you know the, with the passing of the infrastructure bill, uh, in 2021 and the IRA, there are a lot of EV charging stations coming. Lots of, uh, you know, the infrastructure bill 
bill is building out like 500,000 fast charging stations throughout the United States. And there are more state programs that are going to be building out uh, more. So more there are more charger, chargers coming. <laughs> Not sure I about that. Enough. And I will look more in, into that. And if you put your email address, um, I will uh, follow up with you by email um, with a better answer uh, from the city's perspective on that. Sorry about that. Um, OK, yes. Uh, planning to send out the recording. Um, and then Tony, this is a question for you. What are the options to get financial incentives to upgrade 100 amp panels to 200 amp panels in order to increase electrification? Uh, incentives for panel upgrades. Uh, the one that is available right now, I believe, is the federal tax credit. Uh, it's, I believe, 30% of the cost up to $600. I believe that's the current cap on the federal tax credit. So that's an incentive available for uh, 2023. So if the work is done this year, and I believe it has to be associated with a heat pump improvement in the home for that. All right, thank you. I'll paste the link uh, to the tax credit on the in the chat section very shortly. It's going to get that URL. And I'm seeing a question around tax credits for larger condo buildings. Um, I will have to get back to you if you put your email address um, or you could just shoot me an email. Um, we do have a multifamily um, program um, that I can check in with around that. Uh, Tony, there's a question. Can tax credit be accessed retroactively for heat pumps, water heaters um, installed a few years ago? Uh, I believe that prior to 2023, there was the 2022 tax credit and slightly different rules uh, that if you did do it, I think in the prior several years, in 2022 and earlier, it does retroactively apply, So, but it's a one-time credit. So that's the difference between 2023 and prior is that it was a one-time credit that you can only claim once. So if you install the heat pump that is Energy Star and qualifying, uh, you can check the Energy Star webpage. It talks about the, the prior version of, of the tax credit of outlined what qualifies. And I think if you talk with your tax preparer, they might be able to help you uh, claim the credit for a qualifying heat pump or high efficiency equipment if you did it the years prior to 2022, but it was a one-time claim, one-time uh, credit you can claim. Whereas uh, with 2023, it's an annual credit. It resets every year. So that's what I like about the new version of the credits that the Inflation Reduction Act brought out to us. Great, yes, and we will send out that Energy Star um, link with the tax credit information. Um, Tony, not sure if you know this because this is, uh, or Jeffrey, actually, you may, you may know this, or the answer may be Purcell Murray. Um, are there any local vendors that demo induction stove tops? Yes, uh, Purcell Murray in the design district has a couple. Um, I know, that, um, depending on where you live, there there may be a, a couple other options as well, but um, yeah, Purcell Murray is definitely one uh, that has them. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question, are there um, or will there be incentives for infrared panel heaters? Uh, I'm not aware of any for anything that's based on what's called electric resistance uh, type heating, uh, mainly because uh, compared to heat pumps, uh, they're not as efficient uh, when looking at uh, any type of electric panels or electric baseboards. Oh, I should also mention, if you have electric heating today, if you have an electric furnace, there are a couple in the Bay Area, or you have electric baseboard as your main heating, you can qualify for the $1,000 incentive to install a heat pump in your home and go from essentially a three to four times efficiency improvement. Uh, literally for every dollar of electricity you put into a heat pump for heating, you get like $4 worth of heat out of it. So it's definitely worth, uh, if you have electric based heating today, uh, kudos for you because you're already electric, but you can go more efficient. And that's something available for a program today as well. So that's another incentive that is available uh, for those that already have electric based heating as your main heating in your home. All right, thank you. Um, we have a question, is electric tankless water heater a good option? 
Okay, for electric tankless water heaters, uh, generally no, um, because of the cost to uh, heat water with just direct electricity is uh, perhaps a more expensive pathway uh, to heat the water. What makes heat pump water heaters so much more uh, beneficial is that uh, it's three to four times more efficient in heating the same amount of water. So if you have an electric resistance water heater, which is the old style, uh, you can get uh, for a quarter of the cost, uh, the same amount of heat in a heat pump water heater. So there's definitely a benefit to go with a heat pump water heater over an electric resistance. And there are solutions for uh, you know places that already have an electric water heater to replace it with a heat pump water heater. There are definitely multiple solutions available. Uh, you definitely wanna reach out to a participating contractor or an advisor to have that discussion, to help you find out what's feasible in your actual home. Because uh, each home is a little different. Uh, the ideal place is always a garage or a basement, but it can be put in closets too. Uh, there's just a little bit more things like a louver door or a ducting that needs to make it happen in that space. All right. Um, I'm seeing more questions around uh, multifamily buildings. Um, I'll go ahead and send out the link for the Bayren multifamily program. Um, that is for uh, larger uh, residential buildings. Um, we have a question around combined heat pump water heater and house heater. Is this something that will become available? Okay, so this sounds like it's a, a combination system where you want to use hydronic central heating, it sounds like, uh, from this question. Uh, based on this configuration, it may qualify for one or the other, but it can't qualify for both. Uh, types of incentives uh, for that, uh, for these. But I would recommend to reach out to the advisors to talk about the more technical details of that. Uh, but typically, it's only one appliance that's going to be in the home. So it would only qualify for either the heating heat pump or qualify for the water based on its actual uh, actual configuration of that type of heating system. So it's a little more detailed than I can probably explain in the, in the short time we have today. Thank you. This is a question maybe Jackie um, might have more information on or Anika, if you have more detail. Um, you had mentioned there was a time limit to get better rates for installing solar by April 2023. A, a contract must be signed. Can you explain more? Anika, hoping you can take that one. Yeah, I've just been, you know, I'm connected with a lot of environmentalists and I've been getting some emails let, let me try to find that one and yeah there's like the m1 and m nem2 metering i don't know if somebody from bayren actually has that information at their fingertips uh, oh. I can, let me look it up otherwise yeah net energy metering uh my understanding is that the nims three rules kicks in in sometime in april i don't know the exact date it's supposed to be from the date it was approved in december by the uh uh uh, the CP uh, energy when they approved the NIMS three. So if you complete it pretty much by mid-April, there's a maybe a plus or minus few days. Uh, you qualify for net energy metering two versus the new version, which is net energy metering three, uh, which becomes essentially after April. It, that's the only type of energy metering that you have available. But if you can get that completed and the connection contract in place, that should allow you to get qualify for uh, uh, NIMS two. Uh, for your electricity. Yeah, so I'm I'm reading something here. The deadline to get under contract for rooftop solar installation is April 13th in order to be grandfathered in net energy meeting 2.0. Once under contract, applicants will then have three years to do the installation. So really it's just signing the contract that you're gonna move forward with it, but you still have a little more time to do it. That's according to my source at, um, Draw down Bay Area. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, how noisy are heat pumps? Uh, 
uh, heat pumps for space conditioning or heat pump water heaters, I guess that would be a clarification I'd like to get. Uh, heat pumps for space conditioning, they're generally quieter. Uh, they offer, operate at you know constant lower fan speed. So generally it's much quieter than compared to your traditional gas furnace, which some people akin to like sounding like a jet engine when it's on. Uh, heat pumps, whether it's a central centrally conditioned heat pump or ductless heat pumps, they are generally quieter uh, in the way those fans operate. Uh, when it comes to heat pump water heaters, uh, typically, it's if you've ever had a window air conditioning unit or ever seen one of those, uh, that's effectively what is on top of those heat pump water heaters. It looks like a window air conditioner and about the same size compressor. So the sounds are perhaps pretty similar. Uh, most of the vendors I've seen are rating them like at you know, 49 or less dB, some work like 55 dB. So each, of course, each vendor has a slightly different uh, compressor motor. So typically I think the, some of them I've seen is specced at 49, uh, but there are quieter versions out there. Uh, in fact, there's actually uh, other styles heat pump water heaters coming out down the road, but uh, I guess we'll, we'll wait for those when they become actually truly available. Uh, but um, I would say for heat pump water heaters, Back around 49 dB is what I've seen on a lot of specs or around that, uh, plus or minus five dBs. Uh, think of it as a window air, window air conditioner. Uh, typically those are in garages. If it's inside the home, definitely have a more discussion about uh, with the installer about your particular situation, whether it makes sense to be where it is today or maybe relocation might be a more appropriate uh, for your situation. Thank you. Um... Anif, I'm not sure if you know this one. Is there a fire danger using a 110 outlet charging uh, your car in the garage um, if you can't get a 220 installed easily? Um, the only, the, no, nothing that we have uh, heard about. I would advise that you have an electrician check your, um, your outlet, whether it's 120 or 240, just make sure it's set up with the right amount of amps for charging an EV so that you don't uh, blow your circuit. Um, so I, I would just check that. There's very little fire risk for EVs actually, because it's new technology, there's a lot of publicity whenever, or a lot of media attention when there is a fire, but it's actually much less likely for an EV to catch on fire than a gas car. But as I'm answering MB, if you're still there, I don't know if you saw my first answer, but I just wanted to say that uh, manufacturers do recommend that if an EV is in an accident, that you don't park it in the garage until you get it checked out. But other than that, we've not heard that there's any risk of parking an EV in a garage. Many people do. Um, okay, Tony, I've got, I've got a question. We have a House heating system that looks like a regular water heater, which then circulates warm air through the house when the house thermostat turns on. Does a heat pump system make sense for this kind of system? Okay, um, could you put that again? I guess I missed part of that. Part of this sure. Um, we have a house heating system that looks like a regular water heater, which then circulates warm air through the house when the house thermostat turns on. Does a heat pump system make sense for this kind of system? Uh, it's possible, I think. Uh, the challenge, I think, is that not every water heater is designed for that type of hydronic heating application. Uh, that sounds like a central hydronic system uh, where the heat of the water is actually is what heats the air, uh, and it has a, a central blower fan that circulates the air around the house. Uh, I think it need, the water heater needs to be sized to the load or the heating needs of the house, so not not every heat pump water heater works. There are probably specialty versions um, that can meet that application. So you would probably need to talk to a specific contractor that is more knowledgeable in hydronic heating, and they can find a heat pump water heater that could work for that application. Uh, so I believe it's possible. Uh, I, I think of a couple of brands like Sandin, Sanco, CO2 that I believe is possible for hydronic heating. So not, not but that's one brand I've heard about. So definitely a, a specialist who knows more about that can help answer the specific question, can a heat pump water work for your home? And I believe it can, it just needs to find the right type and size. Thank you. Okay, and it looks like we've just run out of time. Um, if I did not get to your question, um, it, you can just hold on. Um, in the next couple of days, I'll send out um, the range of information uh, that we've gone over today. And if you still have questions, feel free to reply to that email um, with your outstanding questions. And 
we'll go ahead and uh, get those answered. Um, thank you so much for joining today and thank you to our speakers.